Finally, it is time to talk about smartphones. Remember when I was talking about how SLRs were revolutionary and changed the game of photojournalism because it allowed you to see exactly what you were taking a picture of? Well, smartphones, I think, are another huge revolution in photojournalism, but this time it's because of its size and its access. Chances are you probably have a smartphone around you right now, either in your pocket or sitting on a desk. They are ever-present and they're a part of our lives. They are connected to data systems that you can immediately upload, uh, pictures that you take. Uh, they are unobtrusive. They fit in your pocket. Uh, they don't stay, make you stand out in a crowd. They're not loud. Uh, they're a lot of not obnoxious, and they're relatively affordable. So I really do think this is the, the next big evolution in professional photojournalism. And the thing that makes it so amazing is its size. Although smartphones themselves are increasingly large, uh, pushing now the 6 and 7 inch screen uh, barrier, uh, the camera inside of them stays relatively small. The little glass part you see that is the lens on your camera, the whole thing isn't much bigger than that. There's a tiny digital lens, there's a tiny sensor inside of that, and there's a little computer that helps it do things like autofocus or connect to the flash part of the camera as well. Now that flash is the devil, but more on that in a second. That's really what makes this so amazing, is that it does so much and accomplishes so much with very little size. And they're getting even smaller. We're now seeing uh, the size of the cameras shrink even as the megapixel and focal length increases. Uh, technology is a really amazing thing. But as amazing as they are because of their size, the fact that they're not obtrusive, the fact that they're affordable, the fact that they're connected to the internet so you can immediately upload any picture you take, which even the fanciest cameras can't do that, they do come with weaknesses. Sometimes it's actually quite a few weaknesses. But a lot of the time it's weaknesses we can work around with just a few small pieces of understanding about how these things work and what the short shortcomings really are we can work around them. The first big weakness that has to be addressed with smartphones, especially using smartphones to do photojournalism, is that the flashes that are built into smartphones are evil. They are terrible. They are way too bright for uh, how they need to be. Uh, they are utilitarian above anything else, so they're simply meant to flood what's in front of them with incredibly bright ghostly light. Uh, it creates bad shadows. Uh, it really creates harsh tones, uh, especially when you're taking pictures of people's faces. It's just overall they are they are terrible. You've probably experienced this at some point where maybe you've been in a um, poorly lit room and someone's gone to take a picture of something or take a picture of you maybe. Uh, they have their flash turned on and you are blinded with the the power of a glowing incredibly bright white orb uh, it can dim your vision for a couple seconds it's so bright um, this is really bad and it's bad for photojournalism it's bad for photography it takes bad photos it's bad so how do you counteract this devilish evil bad that is connected to your phone in the form of the flash well turn the flash off this is the easiest way to do it. There's no magic trick here to make it better. There's no improving the flash that is built into your camera. It is the devil, so turn it off. Find the setting in your camera uh, where you can make it so that it default does not use the flash. Set it to that and never use your flash again. Unless you're coming home late at night and you need to illuminate your car keys to find your home key to get into your house. Now let's say you find yourself really into smartphone photography and you find yourself needing to illuminate things. You, f you find yourself needing some light. Maybe you want to uh, experiment with dark photography or nighttime photography using your smartphone. If that's the case, I suggest picking up a external flash for your phone. Uh, these are often done uh, with either a cord or they're done via Bluetooth. They look like this. They're about the size of a credit card and they glow bright white, they have illumination in them. And then when you go to take a picture, uh, it can either use as a, a strobe, so it'll communicate via Bluetooth and tell it to turn on, 
or it's just on all the time and you position it next to the source with one hand and you take the picture with the other hand. The latter tend to be a little bit more, uh, a little cheaper, a little bit more affordable because they're not trying to connect to the camera itself. But they are designed specifically for photographic lighting. So you end up with way, way less harsh light, way more color temperature, appropriate light. Um, Nova is a company that makes a very popular one of these, a very popular external smartphone uh, flash. And you'll notice here there's a um, uh, two examples, although the sides are switched. Um, on the left, it is the standard flash on the left, and with the Nova flash on the right, you'll notice that it looks way more uh, color appropriate. It looks less washed out. It's less harsh um, using the uh, correct lighting, or not using the standard uh, flash built into your camera. So please just remember this. The, the flash that is built onto your camera no matter how good the camera is, is evil and should never be used. Now the big weakness number two for the cameras built into our smartphones is that the focal points tend to be very shallow. Remember when we were talking about point and shoots, what focal length means. It's the built-in system, built-in measurement within the lens itself that says roughly how far, how close you can be to something and have it still be uh, tight, sharp, and in focus. Because of how small smartphone lenses are, they're really teeny tiny if you look at them, the depth is pretty limited. In order for something to be in focus, you need to be pretty close to it. So how do we fix this? Well, the easiest way to fix it is just to get close. Understand that you're not going to be able to shoot at much of a distance on a smartphone and walk closer to your subject get closer to your subject. Get very close to the thing you're taking a picture of. Get closer than you think you need to be. I really hope you are getting the point here. You have to get close. Uh, you can't rely on the zoom because it is a digital zoom just like a point and shoot. And just like when we were talking about point and shoots, digital zooms are garbage and should never be used. So don't use your fingers to swipe the screen and make it zoom in more. That'll just make it more blurry. Walk closer to the thing you're taking a picture of. And I think that this makes all the difference in the world. And, and here's a really good example of this. This is Michael Christopher Brown. Um, he is a, a freelance photojournalist uh, and he traveled to uh, Libya a couple of years ago when Libya was and kind of still is undergoing a pretty bad civil war. This is shortly after the Arab Spring. And instead of traveling with a lot of camera equipment, instead of traveling with lots of camera bags and lots of lenses and lots of full body DSLRs, all he brought with him was an iPhone. So he went on this very adventurous overseas uh, photojournalism trip to take pictures of a very serious thing about what life is like in Libya during the Civil War. And he was relying 100% on an iPhone. And the shots he gets are really great. Here's a shot of a, a soldier um, with some other rebel groups um, working on a, a anti-aircraft gun, uh, sort of lining things up. You can get crispness off of the, the faces of the subject. The lines in the shot are great. This is a really good piece of photojournalism, and it's shot on an iPhone. It's great for action, too. Uh, the speed in which it can capture a picture is really great. Uh, and the fact that it can capture these things really fast makes it almost on par with an SLR sometimes. Uh, these are two rebel soldiers who are ducking in the back of a pickup because they're being shot at. Um, the photographer himself is ducking down as well because he is also being shot at. But again, this is uh, taken with an iPhone, but it's close to the subject. You are not far away. You're really close up. Here's a, a shot of two guys. Uh, one holding a peace sign up and one holding a pistol and sort of an ironic thing. Uh, but uh, again, if you notice, this photograph would be on, a, on an iPhone would be blurry uh, in distance if it were maybe 20 feet away from the subject. But instead, the photographer is way up close and actually sort of crouched a little bit, shooting upwards to give it a, a, a bigger emotional sense. Uh, but it's crisp, it's in focus, and it's a compelling photograph, and again, taken with an iPhone. Here's another big weakness of a smartphone, 
and that is that stuff like white balance and iso or end up being stuck in automatic modes that are just not going to adjust fast enough uh, they haven't quite caught up to the technology of point and shoots yet mostly because of their size and so you're able to adjust white balance and you're able to adjust iso uh, manually in these cameras uh, but the automatic systems just aren't very good even with modern phones so if you want to fix that this is what you ought to do you ought to find if your smartphone camera allows you to shoot in something called professional mode or pro mode most apple and android phones nowadays do this even my really cheap uh, knockoff android phone allows me to do this and when i pull up the pro mode uh, what it allows me to do is change the ISO, so that is the uh, swipe in the middle that ranges from 100 to 1600, that's various levels of ISO, which we remember is the sensitivity level towards light. Uh, you also get the ability to adjust color saturation, and more on that in a little bit. White balance, which would change the way that the color white is um, received by the sensor and the temperature is adjusted. So these are little things that allow me to adjust on the go, uh, and it's called professional mode in at least my camera and in most cameras now. I would suggest if you're going to go out and shoot for this class on a smartphone, you learn how to work in your phone's smart mode, or a uh, professional mode rather. Now, let's say that you want to adjust things even more than that. There are a series of apps that exist that work off of your existing camera hardware, but give you better software to work on that ends up being built into the phone itself. Um, they exist for both iPhone and Android. Two of the better ones I have found and work with uh, are Camera Plus and Camera Awesome. Uh, they allow you to do some stuff that kind of adjusts like shutter speed, kind of adjusts like aperture. You get a lot of control over detailed white balance and ISO. Um, they're very useful. Um, you might want to make sure that it is saving correctly and working correctly before you load it up and go on assignment with it, but it is still a useful thing to play around with. Now I would warn you, before you start launching the uh, uh, into the world of professional smartphone photography, understand that this is a relatively new area, and that because it's a relatively new area, uh, there's a lot of people looking to get rich with very expensive gadgets. There's tons of people out there selling self-stabilizing gyroscopes and very expensive remote rigs and very expensive uh, <laughs> connections to strobe flashes, all sorts of stuff like that that I just don't think you need. I think that instead of messing around with all this stuff, if you just work on your compositional skills, if you work on getting close to your subject, if you work on the rule of thirds of lighting and framing, if you work on the things that make for good photographs, you really don't need all of this other junk they sell uh, that can attach to your phone. Now I will say one thing that I've found I was really skeptical of, but I actually found really useful, was a set of clip-on lenses. Um, they look like a clothespin, but on one side is a uh, a little tiny lens. They sell fisheye lenses, they sell wide lenses, they sell macro lenses that you can zoom in really close on something. And they just clip over your phone's existing lens, uh, like a clothespin, and allow you to have a little bit of adjustment and manipulation of the light coming in. I have found some of the coolest ones that exist are for less than about five or six bucks on Amazon. Um, and so if you break them, if you lose the pieces and parts, it's not the end of the world. Um, and they're relatively fast to switch out the lenses and clip on and off if you want a shot uh, that has a macro lens or a fisheye or if you don't. Um, they're cheap, they're pretty fun to use, uh, and can give you a little bit more depth or experimental ability when shooting on a smartphone. So that's my big point on smartphones. They are amazing, they're the way of the future, but you have to address and recognize the weaknesses and realize there's things you can do to overcome those weaknesses. And almost all of those things end up being to just simply get closer to the subject you're taking a picture of. Oh, and remember to always turn the flash off, because the flash is the devil. <laughs>